So there's explosions and there's explosions. No call. There. This is a little bit tougher shot entrance than even using the big board that they did in the movie. So last night I was bored watching TV. Now I'm scrolling through movies and I watched the movie Shooter. But in the scene, Mark Wahlberg, AKA Marky Mark, grabs a can of Dinty Moore beef stew, places it on a stump, and tries to figure out what it would take to shoot a soup can at a mile, because it's a far piece. He ends up making the cold bore shot. We're gonna recreate it, and we're gonna figure out, can you really hit a soup can at a mile? We don't have access to the same rifle, the intervention that they used in that video. But we do have a 6BR, shooting this round, which is a 109 hybrid. For comparison, this is a 6.5 Creed. What they're using in the movie would be about yay big, and the bullet would be about the size of this entire case and projectile combined. Um, it's actually a harder shot than what they were showing in the movie. It's still a very difficult shot, regardless. We're gonna walk through all the details from this rifle and how, what you would need out of a rifle like this in order to hit a shot like that. We're at a really cool ranch where they're gonna host a match soon. We only have access to probably between 13 and 1500 yards, but we do have some 300, 600, and 1000 yard shots. And then we're gonna push back and see if we can actually connect with one of these. We're gonna go through a couple of things that we would have to do in order to give ourselves the best possible chance at pulling this off on a first cold war shot. Part of that includes a flawless zero. So we're gonna quickly set up and shoot a 100 yard, maybe three to five shot zero on this rifle. We also need to validate how fast our 6BR 109 grain burger hybrid is actually going. And we'll have to use that to update our profile in our Kestrel. Anything else that we would want to do or you would normally do to validate before a match or before a long range shot? I'd have checked this gun. These bullets are consistent, so I'm pretty confident where the BC is accurate on it right now. The funny thing I get out of this though is the size of that cartridge, tiny compared to the 408 that they're using in the actual movie. We are definitely at a disadvantage on that side. Big advantage we have is we know this gun is extremely accurate. Yeah. 8,004. We're ranging back to the firing line because ranging a log out here is not gonna be the easiest thing to do. Perfect. We have a bunch of these set up downrange. I couldn't find Dinty Moore. Believe it or not, Dinty Moore stew is quite the premium here in Canada. What was it, like 70? 70? $70 for like six cans. We have the equivalent here, the Tim Hortons. I think it's only fitting. Just under three and a half by four and a half. So pretty freaking small. We're gonna start with our first can, 315 yards. Honestly, this should be a pretty easy one. At this range, all that really matters is that you have a great zero and zero offset. So meaning you know where your point of aim is at 100 yards. And second, that you know the muzzle velocity of your projectile and approximate BC. If you're within 50 points of your BC, you're gonna be good to go. It says we need 1.16 mils up and about point one to point two left. So right away, if you're comparing this to the movie, that's what it looks like through your optic on a 25 power scope at 300 yards. I'm gonna go straight up on first shot. All right, let's give her a whack. There we go. All right, 300 yards, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, took one shot. Pretty simple. We hit our first target at 315. Now we're moving to 601. We've already talked you need a very good zero and you need your muzzle velocity. At 600, you need a very, very consistent muzzle velocity in order to hit a target that small. And the wind is really gonna start to play a factor. Even with a mile per hour, we're gonna be several inches left or right of target. I have to take my best guess at first round wind call for 600 yards. All right, so we're dialed on 3.5. Already the target is tiny. The Mirage looks to be boiling. I'm gonna go 0.05 to 0.1 left of center. My gut says this is gonna take two shots, maybe three. High, I'm gonna come right and down. Can gown, okay, two shots. So I'm already keeping in mind that if I was a 10th high on the first shot, we wanna start probably favoring a 10th low on subsequent shots as we go further and further out. 1760's a mile. It's a far piece, Sam. Eh? the president out of worry? It appears in the movie that he has a Schmitten bender on that system. We don't have that with us, so instead we have a loophole mark 
uh, 5 HD. Around 8 to 10 power, we're actually at about 85 yards here, and it looks very similar to the field of view that we saw in the video. We're gonna see if we can recreate what the shot looked like from the cinematics. 1760 is a far piece. Better part of a mile, Sam. By the way, Sam would be deaf. So if you have dogs named Sam, don't put them next to the edge of a 408 Chaytac. See if we can't blow up a can of soup. It hit it, it didn't even explode. So now we've switched and we're using ELDMs, a 223 at about 2,900 feet a second. With the ballistic tips on these, it should explode. Okay, that exploded. So there's explosions and there's explosions. Uh, that worked pretty well. So we talked about muzzle velocity and the POI at the first two. Wind starts to really matter at the 600 yard target. We're at a thousand yards now. Even more variables come into play. One, the firing direction, Coriolis. It's a Coriolis effect of how the earth is spinning versus the direction you're actually facing. The bullet will leave the barrel and as the earth continues to turn, effectively the bullet arrives at a different place than you expect. So we have to account for that. We're gonna grab a quick firing direction, which we're getting approximately 295 degrees. Did you uh, calibrate that? Oh, I didn't calibrate this. So here's one error that we would already have potentially made. The compass on a Kestrel goes out very easily. You really should calibrate it every single time you go to use it. Way different, yeah, like 100% we would have missed that. Yeah, 100 degrees There's Not difference. even a chance. <laughs> Next is wind and wind direction. So we have to account for where the wind is on average coming from, and not just left and right, but also if we think it's coming up or down. If we think it's coming over that hill and pushing downward, we have to aim ever so slightly higher. Yeah, and so, looking at that video, he was crushing here across at least one at canyon. Least, at least one canyon. <laughs> yeah, at a mile, there's a lot of canyons. So I've opened the impeller here, and I'm facing this Kestrel into the wind. It's showing here about a five mile per hour wind, and that would be about 1.2 to 1.3 mils left. Now, that's where we're standing. Do we think that the wind between here and that target is actually staying at about that five to six mile per hour value, or is it less as it gets sheltered by that cliff face? I think it's gonna be less. So let's give this a whirl, 8.3 up and about point, it's, it's even down lower now. I'm gonna drop this initial call to half left and see what happens. All right, so there's a huge steel plate. That steel plate is ginormous. That is not our target. It is there. Now, another thing that's super important at 1,000 yards is level. If I were to tip this left or right, we are going to induce cant into the system. So I have a send it level on this rifle, and that's gonna allow me to make sure my rifle is perfectly up and down so that all the solutions I apply are giving me the best possible chance. Down to half, we're gonna use 0.4 waterline. Ooh, I'm pretty sure I saw that. Let's go to 0.7, that looks like it was correct. Just over the top, if I saw that right, I'm gonna use that hold and put it on the plate. There we go. So that is a 0.6 and waterline. No call, but I know it was close. Go back on steel. Back on steel, center mass. So 0.6, slightly low. Yeah, and that's all of them. All right, so when we put shots on steel, we can see they're hitting on steel at kind of exactly where we thought they were gonna hit. I would probably hit it if I just kept sending round after round after round. Really, this is all about group centering. At that range, if I were to have a bullet land left and this represents my group size, and I bring that to center, there's a much higher chance that the next round is gonna to fall to the right. And I'll be going back and forth, chasing my impact. And I actually am enlarging the group size that I would shoot if I were to just consistently sit there and shoot. We're starting to get way outside of the first round hit probability of even a quarter minute rifle system. But we're gonna try this anyway. So we're gonna push back even further from 13 to 1600. We don't even know how far we can get back there. Ryan, uh, if you had to put your odds <laughs> on our chances of connecting within 10 rounds. At a mile, I would say these conditions, probably under 5%. Okay, I would go 1% to 2%. Yeah. 
All right, this is the furthest back, just about that we could shoot. We can't see the target from anywhere, but effectively right here. And we are at 1,350 yards. So we're still 400 yards, 410 yards short of what they did in the movie. That's 14 mils up at this distance at about 0.7 mils left again. Wind's really, really calm right now, even up here, but it's probably still moving left to right in the valley. But we're now up about two to 300 feet from where we were when we started. So we're shooting almost downhill as opposed to slight uphill before. But the actual drop here, physical drop from where it would have hit if it was a laser down to where it's going to hit is 743 inches. That's a lot of drop. At this distance, everything matters from trigger to follow through to scope level. We need to have a perfect firing direction, which I've already taken, a perfect distance, which we only have plus or minus about three to five yards, perfect wind up and down and left and right so that we know how it's affecting the bullet. And we are dialed to 14 mils. So this is uh, about as difficult as it's gonna get. This is a little bit tougher shot by a fair margin than even using the big bore that they did in the movie. All right, soup can, half a mil left. I think I need to come up about 0.4. Yep, 0.05 left. Yeah, we're starting to see the effects of BC deg now. I've got wind basically nailed. It's just a matter of can it hit it. That one must have been right behind it. Oh. Another tenth left. Yep. Tenth left. Got it. Well, <laughs> so he said, if we hit this, it's not gonna be like skill, it's gonna be luck. And to be honest, like it took a bunch of ciders and two people spotting in order to make corrections to get onto that. But we hit something. We're gonna go check to see if the can actually has a hole in it. But like we said, if you send enough rounds, knowing the center of your cone of fire, you will connect with it eventually. In this case, it took Seven rounds? Seven, seven rounds, seven or eight. Seven rounds. But that doesn't mean I'm good. It just means, frankly, we're a little bit lucky at that point to hit such a small target. You'll see through the scope cam footage, it's a total of about four tenths up and down. I'm close to centered, but because the bullets are slowing down differently and the muzzle velocities are ever so slightly different, they hit one to two tenths high of where you think they're gonna be and then one to two tenths low of where you think they're gonna be. And that's pretty normal for long range. If we were to do this again, a, we should do it with a 300 Norma. There we go. There we go. Oh. This low sodium? <laughs> that would be why. We were able to connect with a soup can at 1350 in less than one mag. Dink. And that's what's left of a 109 from 1350 yards after hitting a soup can. And going through a pipe. And going through a pipe, yeah. It's pretty good, about seven. Especially with a 6BR. A 6BR, so tiny little guy, comparatively speaking. I mean, we can appreciate the entertainment value of what they were trying to do in that movie. And honestly, it's one of my favorite movies. It's a pretty cool one. Despite the fact that it's not quite realistic, it's still pretty cool. Yeah, the next time you come out here, you should bring a sidearm because I'm pretty sure the bears are gonna love this. <laughs>